In the 1920s, American audiences were mesmerized by the mysterious Far East and all things Oriental. None embodied the exotic more than the beautiful and stunning Anna Mae Wong. Anna Mae Wong was the first Chinese American actress to achieve Hollywood stardom and international acclaim. As early as 1922, people around the world recognized the novelty and marvel of this Chinese performer. From the silver screen to the stage, from radio to television, no other Asian American actor created the impact nor held the mystique for her audiences. This is the story of Anna Mae Wong, Frosted Yellow Willows, her life, times, and legend. At the beginning of the 20th century, moving pictures were a new sensation. The American public embraced movies from the start and clamored for more. Hollywood, a subdivision of Los Angeles, became the fertile grounds for this new phenomenon. But on another side of Los Angeles, in a desolate section known as Chinatown, gathered another community that had been rejected by mainstream society. Prompted by rising anti-Chinese sentiment, the Chinese Exclusion Act was passed in 1882, taking away many basic rights for Chinese in America. The Immigration Service only allowed about 100 Chinese to enter the United States each year. They were predominantly comprised of Chinese dignitaries, merchants, and scholars. Then the Geary Act of 1892 would require Chinese in America to register with the government. New immigrants were now subjected to rigorous interrogations and jail-like conditions. Not only at Angel Island, located near San Francisco, but also at other immigration stations around the country. Prior to the Chinese Exclusion Act, Anna's grandfather, Wong Wong, a merchant, came to America for the commerce opportunity generated by the gold rush in California. He settled in Michigan Bluff, California, where Anna's father, Sam Wong, was born. Due to the sudden unforeseen deaths of his parents, Sam was left to fend for himself at a very young age. He worked in the gold mines and did odd jobs. Finally, he saved enough money to sail to China to seek a wife. In 1885, Sam left his new wife and baby son in China to return to America to make enough money so they could follow. While he was in China, a law was passed that prohibited the wives of Chinese laborers from entering the U.S. He eventually settled in the laundry business, but his hopes to bring his family to America were dashed. Sadly, Sam would later hear that his wife had died. In 1901, a marriage was arranged between Sam Wong and 15-year-old Toy Lee, a Chinese-American born in San Francisco. They immediately moved to the outskirts of Chinatown in Los Angeles and started a Chinese laundry and a family. On January 3, 1905, in the back of a Chinese laundry on Flower Street, Toy gave birth to her second daughter, Song. Song's full Chinese name was Wong Liu Song, meaning frosted yellow willows. She later adopted the American name Anna Mae while attending California Street Grammar School. Sam and Toy eventually had eight children, although only seven survived. The family lived above the heat and pungent smell of lai that wafted up from the laundry. Like traditional Chinese daughters and sons, Anna, her two sisters, and four brothers toiled alongside their parents from dawn to dusk. 
At a young age, Anna fell in love with the glamorous world of make-believe. She played hooky from Chinese school to see movies at the Nickelodeon. Her favorites were the Perils of Pauline serials of 1914. The film starred two of her favorite actors, Pearl White and Crane Wilbur. She dreamt of joining the moving picture world. Her father disapproved, but it would be his friend, James Wang, who helped Anna get her first break in motion pictures. He worked as an extra and also assisted the studios with finding other Asian extras. Upon Anna's unending persistence, he finally took her to Metro Pictures. There, she signed up with the casting department and did crowd work for about a year. In 1919, 14-year-old Anna was cast as one of many lantern bearers in Arla Natsimova's The Red Lantern. Even though she was still only an extra, Anna got a taste of the exciting life before the camera. She was hooked. Occasionally, Anna skipped school to look for work in any production that would have her. Fox Film, Metro, First National, Universal. She even managed to find a few days of work in Thomas Inns' Mother of Mine. Thomas Inns had previously introduced another Asian actress, Japanese-born Suru Aoki, to the American film audience in 1913. Later, Suru Aoki was to marry the actor-producer Sashua Hayakawa. Anna gave the money she made working on films to the family, but it did not ease her father's displeasure with her choice to work in motion pictures. When she was not working on films, Anna modeled furs for the Los Angeles Furrier Company and continued helping out at the family laundry. Then in 1921, Marshall Nealon, producer and director of First National Pictures, Bits of Life, cast 16-year-old Anna as Long Cheney's wife in Hop, the third episode of four short stories. It thrilled Anna to finally see her name on the screen. The following year, Anna was chosen to star opposite leading man Kenneth Harlan in Toll of the Sea. Technicolor's color feature film was a Chinese version of the famous Japanese fable Madame Butterfly. parents were still dismayed at the daughter's pursuit of a career in moving pictures. How could a Chinese-American actress survive a public life in a society that vilified the Chinese? But Anna could not be confined to the role of the traditional Chinese girl. So at 17, Anna moved out of her parents' home and into an apartment of her own. Determined to develop her career, the fledgling actress auditioned for any role that was available. She played an Indian, a Middle Easterner, an Eskimo, a Hispanic, and a Polynesian. But more often than not, Anna was cast as a Chinese servant. Undaunted, Anna continued to work. On the sets of the Alaskan, and Peter Pan, where she met another Chinese-American, cinematographer James Wong Howe, who would become a lifelong friend. Anna was beginning to draw attention. Douglas Fairbanks Sr. had seen her in Bits of Life and was so impressed that he asked her to play the Mongol slave in his ambitious production, The Thief of Baghdad.
This role showcased her exotic charm and maturing sensuality. And audiences took notice. She received complimentary reviews for her performance and screen presence. New film opportunities increased Anna's hope for a role that would earn her recognition, not just as an oriental figure, but as an actress. Anna was starting to work more often, but yet she was still not getting the type of roles that she was longing for. At age 20, Anna began making the Hollywood social scene and gaining notoriety. On Amistice Day, November 11, 1925, Sid Groman and his father, David J. Groman, asked Anna to drive the first rivet into the steel girders of what was to become the Groman's Chinese Theater on Hollywood Boulevard. During the groundbreaking ceremony on January 6, 1926, Anna was by the side of Sid Groman, Charlie Chaplin, producer and leading actress Norma Talmadge, and actor Conrad Nagel. Also in 1926, Anna was being considered for the female lead, Nang Ping, in the Lone Cheney classic movie, Mr. Wu. But to Anna's disappointment, the role was offered to a non-Chinese Rene Adori instead. Once again, Anna was cast in the role of the Chinese servant. Despite her failure to garner a lead, the name and reputation of the Yellow Wonder, as Anna was sometimes referred, was already spreading to international communities, particularly the artistic ones. When these artists came to Hollywood, they always wanted to meet the intriguing Chinese flapper that they had heard so much about. Hal Roach Sr., who produced such classic series as Our Gang and Laurel and Hardy, signed Anna to his Western feature, The Desert's Toll, in 1927. She played Onetta, an American Indian. Later, in Mr. Roach's comedy short, The Honorable Mr. Bugs, Anna was cast as the Baroness Stoloff. Here, she was able to show her comedic ability. In Warner Brothers' Old San Francisco, Anna worked with Dolores Costello and Swedish actor Warner Olin, who was later to become the infamous Charlie Chan character. Its insulting portrayal of the Chinese reflected how Chinese were regarded throughout the country. And later, Anna would be criticized about why she chose to take on such roles. But despite the setbacks, Anna loved the magic of motion pictures. Between roles, Anna visited movie sets such as Norma Talmadge's The Dove and often appeared as an extra or in crowd scenes, sometimes as a favor, sometimes to work with a particular actor or actress, and sometimes just because her family needed the money. Although she worked quite often, the roles themselves became increasingly limited. Her beauty and talent could not overcome a glaring obstacle. She was still Chinese, and Hollywood would not cast her in leading roles, even a Chinese one. So in 1928, when German film director Richard Eichberg offered Anna a leading role in his next film project, she eagerly accepted. She set sail for Europe on March 28, 1928. Anna's destination, Germany. Richard Eichberg had seen Anna in Tour of the Sea and had wanted to work with her ever since. Her European film debut, Song, opened to mixed reviews.
In Europe, Anna wanted to expand her skills to the stage. In 1929, she traveled to London to perform in Basil Dean's Circle of Chalk. At the new theater, co-starring a young Laurence Olivier, Anna received so much criticism for her American accent that she took elocution lessons in London. Anna joked afterwards that she took 200 guineas worth of English in order to get rid of her Chinese-American accent. The European community saw Anna as more than just Chinese. It was here that Anna began living the high life and becoming the toast of high society. The roles they offered broadened Anna's versatility as an actress. She portrayed High Tang in Richard Eichberg's Pavement Butterfly. Show Show and E.A. DuPont's Piccadilly. herself in Adrian Brunel and Alfred Hitchcock's L Street Calling. <laughs> but it would be her next role that would truly test her abilities. Talking pictures were becoming popular with movie audiences, but many actors could not make the transition and fell by the wayside. By now, Anna had become fluent in German and well-versed in French. British International Pictures was planning different versions of High Tang, also known as the Flame of Love, in English, German, and French. They chose two different casts with different leading men. John Longdon, Francis Lederer, and Robert Anselin. She delivered her dialogue in all three languages without voiceovers. Her impressive performance won praise from both the European movie critics and audiences. He must not die. Your Highness, you must pardon. You must. You may ask me what you will. I thank you, Father. All that I have of love to give is yours. Will you always remember that? I don't. We will forget the past. We must. We will think only of the future. Too late. Too late. Right on. Building upon her success in the summer of 1930, Anna appeared in Shin Shi, an operetta in Vienna, Austria. Performing in German, she sang and danced into the hearts of the audience. In Europe, she found acceptance as a performer that had allured her in Hollywood. Through hard work and a quick mind, she had proven herself. But this was Europe, not home, not Hollywood, not America. Anna was doing well, but she missed her family. She sailed back to the U.S. on the SS Aquitania. During the journey, she received a cable offering her the female lead in Edgar Wallace's Broadway play, On the Spot. 
she would be replacing Marie Carroll for the role. It opened on October 29, 1930, and ran for nearly seven months in New York. Was America accepting her at last? Then, during the run of On the Spot, Anna received tragic news from California. Her mother, Toy, was struck by an automobile in front of their house and was hospitalized. Devastated by the news, Anna was torn between leaving to be with her mother and fulfilling her contractual obligation. She chose to stay. She received heartbreaking news. Her mother had died from her injuries. This loss forever changed Anna. Because of her strength and sense of commitment to her family, 25-year-old Anna took the responsibilities of the family onto her shoulders. With the success of her run on Broadway and the emergence of her international stardom, Hollywood began to woo Anna. In May of 1931, Paramount Pictures signed her to a long-term contract. This offer brought Anna back to Los Angeles and allowed her to be closer to her family. Her first film was to be Daughter of the Dragon. She would play the lead role of Ling Moy. Sexua Haikawa and Warner Olin also starred in this melodrama. Then you? I, your father, am Fu Mantu. Live, live, divine father. Infamous father. Death lays its hands upon me, and my sacred work is unfinished. Master, let this unworthy slave finish the sacred work. Only one of the house of Fu can redeem our honor. The blood is mine. The hate is mine. The vengeance shall be mine. My flower daughter. The knife would wither your petal fingers. God to my ancestors. If only thou had granted me another son. Father. Father. I will be your son. I will be your son. Swear, man daughter, to deliver the soul of Ronald Petrie to me, to our ancestors. I swear. Although it was a financial success and Paramount rewarded Anna with a phenomenal three-picture deal, they did not increase her salary. Anna was cast with Marlena Dietrich, Clive Brook and Warner Olin in Joseph von Sternberg's classic film, Shanghai Express. This role would become one of her most well-known and memorable performances as the prostitute Hui Fei. Not at all. Come in. It's a bit lonely on the train, isn't it? I'm used to having people around. They put my dog in the baggage car. That's why I dropped in on you. I have a boarding house in Shanghai. Yorkshire pudding is my specialty, and I only take the most respectable people. Don't you find respectable people terribly... Dull, I'm sure you're very respectable, madam. I must confess, I don't quite know the standard of respectability that you demand in your boarding house, Mrs. Haggerty. Next, Paramount loaned Anna out to Fox Film Corp to play a murderous accomplice in a study in Scarlet, a Sherlock Holmes adventure. Dissatisfied, Anna returned to England, where she had developed strong ties and friendships with members of the various film and performing arts colony. There she was offered challenging lead roles as she waited for Paramount to cast her in her next contracted film. 
Anna came back to Hollywood for only long enough to fulfill her third picture obligation to Paramount with Limehouse Blues, opposite George Raft. She also saw her father and members of her family off as they set sail for China. She returned to London to finalize plans for the upcoming European tour of her one-woman show. European audiences adored Anna. When she left in 1930, she had promised that she would return in another stage show. In 1935, Anna took her one-woman stage show throughout Europe. She performed in Denmark, Sweden, Norway, France, Italy, Spain, and throughout England. After her European tours, Anna returned to the U.S. to wait for news about the role of a lifetime. She had been anticipating MGM's film version of Pearl S. Buck's The Good Earth. Since 1933, she had heard rumors that W.S. Van Dyke was going to direct it. She felt that this would be the vehicle that would finally establish her as a star and a serious actress. In 1935, MGM was setting up to cast and start production with Sidney Franklin directing. Anna was to lose the lead role to Austrian-born actress Louise Rayner who had just won an Oscar the year before and who would later win a second Oscar for her role of Olan. Instead, Anna was offered to test for the lesser supporting role of the second wife. She tested twice for the supporting part, but the casting agent felt that Anna was not beautiful enough to play the courtesan. Bitterly disappointed, Anna left before filming began. The role eventually went to Austrian-born actress Tilly Losch. Could it be that Hollywood once again shied away from casting a Chinese person for the lead role of a major motion picture, even if the character was Chinese? Anna sailed for China in January of 1936. Her father and other members of her family had left the United States while Anna was in Europe Anna went to join them to experience the country of her ancestors. She was treated like a star. When Anna arrived in Shanghai, she was greeted by Chinese dignitaries as well as members of the Chinese film industry. She was entertained by the Star Film Company and artists like Butterfly Wu, China's premier actress and Anna's Chinese counterpart. It was not complete admiration, however. During her meetings with the press, she was often asked why she would choose to play roles that reflected the Chinese in a negative light. She answered directly that she had very little control over the parts offered by the studios. She could only take the film jobs that were offered her. Till the fall, Anna continued her tour through Shanghai, Suchow, Beijing, and her father's wing on village near Canton. Anna had the insight to ask China's famed newsreel Wong to film her journey throughout China. She also wrote a journal of her travels that was printed in the Los Angeles Times, New York Times, and numerous other newspaper publications she finally experienced the history and tradition that she had only heard about and headed back to the U.S. with a head and heart full of stories of her people. In March of 1937, Anna experienced the dark side of fame. Anna and the family of David O. Selznick each received extortion letters that threatened both them and their families. The culprit, Dr. Alan Foote, threatened to physically harm them if they did not each pay him $20,000. Newspapers sensationalized the shocking event. Luckily, the authorities caught him before any harm came to either of their families. Eventually, the man was declared insane, 
and commit it to a mental institution. Her first project after returning from China was Paramount's Daughter of Shanghai, directed by Robert Florey, opposite her childhood friend, Korean-American actor Philip Ang. With the film's financial success, Paramount re-signed Anna to another three-picture deal. Movie audiences loved its Chinese-American star. Then, world events intruded. In August of 1937, Anna received news that Japan had invaded Shanghai. Her younger sister Mary was still living there. After much uncertainty, she learned that Mary had barely escaped Shanghai just as the Japanese were attacking the city. Anna tried to put her fears aside and continued to work, but the worsening situation in China preoccupied her. She had been working desperately to get her father and the rest of her family out of China, fighting technicalities in the Chinese Exclusion Act. Finally, by 1938, Anna was able to get her entire family back in the U.S. Now with her family together again, Anna was able to use her fame to draw attention to the China War relief, working with various Chinatown communities. Now I see a very charming, lovely lady sitting here. I think it's Anna Mae Wong, motion picture actor. Anna Mae, would you mind telling me what you think? On this uh, occasion, what does it mean to you and your people? It's a good opportunity for my people to show America, their adopted country, what China can offer to America by way of culture, philosophy, high ideals, and the arts. The new center where eventually there will be room to show the very really beautiful faces of Chinese civilization. L.A. Chinatown even asked Anna to serve as a Grand Marshal in the Chinatown Moon Festival Parade. The community recognized the prominence of Anna's status outside Chinatown and the attraction that she would draw for Chinese causes both here and abroad. Anna fulfilled her three-picture deal with Paramount, including the loan out to Warner Brothers for When Were You Born? and Paramount's own King of Chinatown, an island of lost men. Although these were considered B-movies or low-budget movies, they made money for the studio and received positive reviews. In 1939, Anna's stage show toured with highlights from Hollywood throughout Australia to raise awareness and funds for the China war relief effort. Thank you so much, Dr. Bao and Madam Bao. You've extended me a most warm welcome, and I thank you very much. To the many Chinese who are listening in, may I say, Lat Wei Pang Yu, no more Nico Go Fun Hei Ping Wan, Dodger, Dodger. One of the poignant moments in Anna Mei Wong's life was the suicidal death of Mary, Anna's younger sister at the tender age of 26. Mary was unable to deal with the harsh realities of being a Chinese woman in America, trying to establish her own independence. Just like her brother, James, Mary turned to Shanghai, China to pave her way before the war broke out, away from under the shadows of her famous sister, Anna. Work office dwindled, Anna was no longer contracted with any studio. She was cast in Columbia's Ellery Queen's Penthouse Mystery, which starred Ralph Bellamy and Margaret Lindsay. When the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor in 1941, Anna set her career aside to get even more involved with the Chinese war relief, raising money and publicizing the plight of the people in China. Anna and her other siblings did what they could on the home front. In addition, Anna entertained at the USO tour camps in Alaska and Canada, bringing a bit of home away from home to US and Allied troops during the war. 
Anna and her friend James Wong Hao broadcast on radio programs to boost morale and rally support for China. Our hostess is the brilliant and talented Anna May Wong. Kung Hei, thank you. And now among our distinguished guests this evening is one of America's leading motion picture cameramen, Mr. James Wong Hao. Thank you, Anna May Wong. You spoke for all of us when you said your heart is with China on this occasion of the Spring Festival. During this period, Anna starred in two low-budget American PRC films. They were titled Lady from Chongqing and Bombs Over Burma. You cannot kill me. You cannot kill China. Not even a million deaths could crush the soul of China. For the soul of China is eternal. When I die, a million will take my place. And nothing can stop them. Neither hunger, nor torture, nor the firing squad. We shall live on until the enemy is driven back over scorched land and hurled into the sea. That time will come soon, for the armies of decency and liberty are on the march. China's destiny is victory. It will live because human freedom will not perish. Out of the ashes of ruin and old hatred, the force of peace will prevail until the world is again sane and good. These films reflected her support and sympathy for China. In 1943, Madame Chiang Kai-shek and her entourage came to the United States to plead for the plight of war-torn China with the invasion of the Japanese. Even though Anna Mae Wong had donated her time and energy to this cause years in advance, for some reason she was never recognized for her efforts and devotion by Madame Chiang Kai-shek nor her people. By the end of the war in 1945, Anna was 40 years old. Over 25 years had passed since she started her quest to become a Hollywood star. But even with her devotion, commitment to the craft and patriotism, Hollywood never accepted an actress aging. In 1946, Anna began to experience a bout of health problems. She decided to take a well-deserved break. Now Anna wanted some time with her family. It had been six years since Anna was on the silver screen, but in 1949, when her friend director Arthur Lubin asked her to be in his film, Impact, she agreed. Her health problems were compounded by her father's passing. Though he lived to 91, Anna felt this loss deeply. Even though he initially objected to her career, he had become her biggest supporter. She retreated to Moongate, her Santa Monica home. Film office continued to dwindle. With the bitter aftertaste of World War II, the American public lost its appetite for Asian-themed movies. Anna would need to look elsewhere to practice her craft. With the introduction of television, Anna was given the opportunity to act in the small screen format. In 1951, 46-year-old Anna flew to New York to begin her own television series on the Dumont Television Network. She was nervous, and for one of the few times in her life, she was unsure if she could succeed. The gallery of Madame Lu Song lasted for only 13 episodes, but it offered Anna another medium in which to express herself. Once again, Hollywood beckoned. Producer Ross Hunter cast Anna in his drama 1960s Portrait in Black with Anthony Quinn and Lana Turner. It was to be her last performance. When Mr. Hunter asked Anna to perform in his next project, Flower Drum Song, 
Anna accepted. But she later bowed out of her commitment due to failing health. Her lifetime fight and struggle to be an actress finally took its toll. In December of 1960, Anna fell gravely ill and under doctor's care. On February 3rd, 1961, Anna Mae Wong died in her Santa Monica, California home of a heart attack caused by complications of cirrhosis of the liver. She was 56. Anna Mae Wong remains an international movie star icon. She was an Asian American pioneer woman at a time when all was against her the system, Hollywood, and her people. She had a passion and dared to strive for a dream, to be an actress. Anna Mae Wong walked the path alone with great courage and luminous beauty. She led the way for Asian actors to follow and paid with her health, heartaches, and humiliation. She was and always will be the daughter of the dragon. The question is, was it worth it? When I was growing up, I was tremendously struck by Anna Mae Wong. I thought she was incredibly sexy, incredibly beautiful, a figure that I've never forgotten. And I would always want to see a film with Anna Mae Wong, whatever it was like. And it's very exciting that now young people again are discovering her. Films are being shown all over the world. An Asian original has struck a chord with a new generation, which is tremendously exciting. I think she would be successful today. First, because she had talent. Second, because she had an innate understanding of acting for the screen. I never saw her on stage, of course, but I've seen her in so many different films from different periods of her life. But there's that one consistent quality of knowing how to play for the camera. And that's a gift, that's a great gift that not many people have. So I think that would still be as evident today as it was then. Anna Mae Wong was, a kind, was in great contrast to what was on the screen, but it was on the screen when she started out, she was a siren, a very sexy siren, or she could be a very dangerous, villain in, in the pictures and the other ones that I saw. And in person, she was very sweet, very demure, very polite, and overly friendly with everybody. Just everybody was, was her friend. And in person, she was in such great contrast to some of the pictures that she played on the, on the screen. She also was a very intelligent lady. I think Anna Mae Wong was very exceptional. In all my research looking at um, the 1900s, um, the first half of the 20th century, and looking at Chinese American women's lives and, and their work lives as well as their family lives and their community lives, there are very few, there are no, there's no other person like Anna Mae Wong who was able to pursue acting and become successful at it in terms of making many films and being able to make a living being an act actress. Um, it didn't happen for anyone else that I know of. There were Chinese Americans, men and women, who talked about being extras and having a few parts in films here and there, uh, but they never sustained that and they weren't able to find work and they weren't as popular as an actor, well known as an actor or actress as Anna Mae Wong was. Now if we look at these films again, we should 
be able to understand anyone really try to do her best to achieve something to uh, let the world see that Chinese woman can really act her efforts really pay out following a small role in a John Gilbert vehicle she was offered the lead in the first Technicolor production The Toll of the Sea which was a Chinese variation on the Madame Butterfly theme and at one point, and I guess in the early 50s, she had a chance to go back to New York and do a live TV series for 13 weeks. She would have the lead. Uh, unfortunately, it only was shown in the New York area. For the actors, the young Asian actors coming up today, they get a chance to see someone that started uh, when the film business was in its infancy. and the hardship that she went through, how hard she had to fight for everything. I mean, even today, I think we, are, we Asian Americans are still fighting for better roles, for better jobs. And so I think hopefully by this documentary that they will get encouraged. And whatever you choose to be or whatever you want to do in your life, um, to stay with it, you know, and hang in there. And, and I think if you put enough effort and time in it, um, hopefully you'll win, or you will win. Mm -hmm.